Hello Life Changers, thank you so much for joining us. We have got an amazing sermon for you, so why don't you lean in, grab a notebook, grab a pen, and get ready to hear of the more that God has for us. Such a privilege to be sharing this morning, to be being together, and we're so excited for all that God is doing in the life of the church, even just meeting new families that have joined at the Century City since we've been in there the last two weeks. And um, I had the privilege of preaching there last week and seeing God adding life and color and all that he's doing at this time. It's such a privilege to do this together and um, to see what God is going to do. I'm telling you, God's going to do miracles in our midst. And as much as we're trusting for him to do this building thing, I'll tell you what, I'm praying as much for God to bring order and peace to finances and families' homes. I'm trusting for supernatural jobs. I'm trusting for God to provide in supernatural ways within our community. Those are the testimonies we're gonna tell. Those are the stories we'll keep telling far beyond this building. It's not about buying a building. It's about lives changed, transformed, encountering the living God and stepping into the more at this time of all that he is doing. But welcome, who felt the winter this morning? A little bit cold. Some of you are like, nah, I could sleep in this morning. Jump on the couch. There's no, uh, the guys are watching at home on their couch. They're like, a little bit cold for church this morning. No, I'm a little bit like that too. It's a little bit like sometimes you want to settle in and, and the couch becomes the place of all things these days. You can fill your cupboards through Checker 60 from your phone. If you fancy and you've got an air conditioner, you can control the climate. You don't have to submit to this Cape Town winter. You can make it warmer. You can then navigate your way through whatever entertainment, wherever you want to go in the world, or from the comforts of your couch. That's how life has become designed. That's how we are navigating. And that's the challenge of our age is that we simply slip into stories and slip into comforts. And I want to speak this morning a word that is a little bit challenging. Is that all right? We've been seeing series. We finished our Move Again series. We're jumping into a new series next week called What It's Like. And we're speaking through the parables of Jesus as he speaks and tells parables about what the kingdom of heaven is like. We're going to be teaching that for the next few weeks and super excited for that. But I want to jump into today in fighting a battle, and it's called this, Defeating the Enemy of Apathy. Am I the only one in the room sometimes gets a little apathetic? I see that hand. Thank you for that. One honest person at church today. And, um, but it is. It's a challenge. We can quickly default to apathy. And I'm telling you, it's a challenge. And it's not just a physical problem. It's not just a career problem. And it's not just a, an athletic ability problem. Like I keep promising every year, this is the year of the athlete. And then apathy, when I realize you actually have to train. I think it's shocking that you can't do six push-ups and get a (laughs) six-pack. Honestly, I think God's economy, he got it wrong in that one. I I really don't think you should have to burn this many calories and go to gym this many times. I'm intimidated to go to gym in Cape Town. In Durban, you could wear seven different colors outfits and go to gym. No one cared. Now in Cape Town, you've got to go, like the shoes are matching the pants and they're matching the shirt and they're like slide. They don't even walk into gym. They just slide in. That's how cool Cape Townians are. But anyway, that's not what I'm preaching this morning. We're in an age of spiritual apathy. And I would present that it's not, people are not completely apathetic, but, but we, we seem to be apathetic sometimes about the things that have eternal and big impact and really passionate about some things that don't necessarily And we fight these things on the playgrounds of Facebook and Instagram and social media. We fight passionately for some things that are very temporal. And I'm including the church. I'm talking the church general. I'm talking the challenge of our time is that we get pulled into battles that don't necessarily have eternal value. And we've forgotten our mission and our mandate, which is eternity. And I want to remind us and challenge us in terms of apathy and navigate. This has been a problem since the beginning of age. And I've said this story a number of times. I want to keep throwing at us as Jesus goes into Gethsemane and he's about to be put on the cross. He knows what's coming. So he takes his tightest mates, Peter, James, and I. He takes them. He says, come, boys. And the Bible says he's full of sorrow. He's sorrowful and troubled. He says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. You would think like they would get up for that. One hour later, it comes back, tossing, sleeping. Boys, wake up. Yeah, 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 we got this, we got this, we got this. King of the world, yes, we got this. We've seen miracles. We've seen him raise the dead. When he says, stay awake, we're going to stay awake. And I don't know about you, but it's like the best intentions to go to gym. I'm going to do this one week later. It's far too cold. (laughs) Rusk, Smilo, Rusk, Smilo, Rusk, Smilo. It's like we default quickly, and that's called apathy. 
And then they fall. He comes back an hour later. They're sleeping again. He comes a third time. They're sleeping. He says, okay, now we've got to go. Now they're horribly unprepared, horribly unprepared for the biggest event eternity has ever seen on this side of Jesus coming again. They're unprepared. But Jesus takes them into a battle. And I want to present to us today that the challenge of our age is that we sometimes don't see the battles that are real, that we are fighting, that have major implication. So we don't respond with the urgency that our times require. And we settle down and it's become, I not only can be entertained from home, I can no longer, but now I can work from home. So everything's become around my comfort. And I just had these three words land the other day in worship as I'm challenging this thought. Because here's the thing. Even the good, good Samaritan who walks along the street says, actually, he's a master of the law. He says to Jesus, actually, what do I have to do to enter the kingdom of God? What do I have to do? He's asking a question that most of us are asking. And this is what we're early asking. How little do I have to do? What's the least I can do? It's like how few push-ups can I do to look like that guy? And, and how, how, how little do I have to give of myself to have relationships that look healthy? And, and it says this in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because Jesus says, love the Lord your God. He says, no, but who's my neighbor? He's looking for the angle. He's looking for the loophole. He's looking for the terms and conditions that get him out of any real personal sacrifice. And then the, the good Samaritan scenario plays out, and it's, it's the others. The priest walks past. He says he passed by on the other side of the road. The one guy who should have had the heart, who should have had the time, who part of his job possibly was to minister that situation, sees a guy who's been broken, beaten up by robbers and thieves, walks straight past. But the Samaritan stops, and Jesus says, actually, you do the same. And I can just imagine this expert of the law going, oh, I really was hoping for an easier answer. I just wanted an easier answer. I feel really good. I feel really justified in my position, maybe of walking past that situation. So I want to speak today in terms of self-justification, but more in terms of apathy. See, the challenge is we, become, we have become masters of self-justification. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, we are masters of it. I remember Candace, we were in England years ago and she got burnt and she ended up spending a week or 10 days in a hospital and my mates arrived in England with a 12 pack of Krispy Kremes. And I felt completely justified in eating my way through all 12 because my wife was suffering in hospital. I was eating my way through and I ate another box the next day. And, but the challenge is we become justified. It's, we're watching something on TV that we know we shouldn't, but oh, we've had a tough day and everyone else is doing it. And we judge people who drive poorly on the roads and how many accidents there are in our nation. But we're a little bit late for our meeting, so it's okay for us to drive just that little bit. We all do it. Some of you are like, I never do. Oh, good. good. That's why we need you. And we make commitments to pay people on time, but then we get a bit tight and someone else hasn't paid us and we self-justify while we don't have to pay. And the Bible says, no, there's a different standard. It's a different standard for believers. And Jesus speaks to us and he challenges that, that, that law expert, the expert of the law, asks him, what should we do? Jesus says, go and do likewise. Yeah. It's a challenge to an apathetic heart that thinks I've done enough. Yeah. I want to tell you, apathy is the greatest killer in the church. Yeah. We, we keep casting. I, I, there was one granny, I was in so many prayer meetings where she cast the devil out of Durban. I see amazing Durban out here. Uh, there was one, she cast the devil out of Durban so many times. I think we should have dealt with the devil in the room called apathy of my own heart. Jesus dealt with the devil. I'm pretty sure the devil's still in Durban sometimes. I'm just saying, I'm not discrediting that granny, but I just thought it was interesting. And, um, but it's the silent killer that's hard to address and sometimes hard to identify. It's this internal killer that gets inside that doesn't actually need an invitation. And you know what the challenge is? The Bible says that actually an apathetic heart, when there's apathy in the heart, sins close to the door. It's just close. Ephesians 3 verse 3, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. This is not my standard. This is not a life changer standard. This is the Bible. The Bible says there's enough power in walking with the Spirit of God so there would not even be a hint of sexual immorality in the church. Not my standard. So when people come, but, oh, but the world's here and this is here. And you know what? My, my, my girlfriend and I just need, because we're stressed. I don't care about your stress. The Bible says, not a hint. I'm not trying to be ungracious. I'm trying to be the most gracious I can be. Run to Jesus. Trust Jesus. Allow him to be your every satisfying thought, power, everything. And when we hold on to that, we start realizing that we are in a fight. 
We're in a fight. And three things I felt, I was just in a worship time, actually in another meeting, not at church here, and, and God spoke three words to me in challenging this, for my own heart. This is me preaching to myself today. Embrace discomfort, and I'll explain what I mean. Embrace disruption, and embrace disdain. If you take away anything, just take away those concepts, take away those thoughts, and let's understand, because in 2022, first of all, I want to speak about embrace discomfort. In 2022, comfort is king. If you can sell anything with a packaging of comfort, you're winning at life. That's literally how our world operates. It's fly from the couch. The challenges the gospel doesn't present. And as I look at any Bible character, there's no comfort presented in their story. David gets taken away. He gets gone. And then he ends up sitting for years in a cave with 300 disgruntled, disillusioned, and in debt men. That wasn't comfortable. It's not comfortable. Then we see Moses gets taken and God goes to Moses who's been out in the desert for 40 years says, I want you to take on Pharaoh. That was not comfortable for Moses. That wasn't like, God, have you got another one? Like, is there any other assignment? No, and, and we, see that, we, we see that Stephen, as he's being stoned, smiling, with us, that wasn't a comfortable experience. I'm, I'm, we're kind of trying to make light of it, but that's the Bible. And I'm pretty sure, as we understand and look at Jesus on the cross, I'm pretty sure... In the brief of the cross, wasn't this, make it comfortable. I'm pretty sure the Bible says he was broken and bruised with chunks of flesh coming out and a spear in his side. And yet we read it and it's in our prayers, if you listen to the prayers of much of the world, sometimes it's this, God, would you make us comfortable if we really whittled it down? And the challenge is we know it in the world and there's the concept of a comfort zone. Anyone heard that term before? You're in your comfort zone. What does it mean? It means, well, actually, if it's your job, you're in a zone and a space where you could do your job with your eyes closed and meet the minimum standards that are required. You could achieve that, no problem. And the challenge is we do the same thing with our spirituality. We do the same thing with our trust in Jesus. I know this is challenging, and this is like... Uh, but, but I've got to, with, as, as a pastor and a friend, speak. And, and Joshua was that guy. He's the guy who gets handed the reins from Moses. But he was the guy who was just outside the presence of the tent of meeting. He was there all the time, but now his assignment has changed. He's out of his comfort zone, and God knows he needs a perp talk. And God speaks to him in, one, in Joshua 1, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? It is this pep talk, not to a guy who was failing. He was achieving in his comfort zone, but God had called him to more. And I'm telling you, God's called you to more. It's called me to more. But my heart wants to default. My heart wants to default. I become an apathetic friend. Let me challenge all of us today. Don't put your hand up, but maybe you become an apathetic friend and you're wondering who your friends have gone. I can become an apathetic father and justify why I don't have time, why it's okay for me to be grumpy at home because of what I deal with at work, why I had to travel in the, in the traffic and fight jobs so that you could, I can become an apathetic father. I become an apathetic lover of my wife. I become an apathetic lover of Jesus. And yet, I don't see that as the response to the cross. And unless we are prepared to leave our comforts behind, apathy will determine our impact and effectiveness in this life. It'll be the determining factor. And I'm telling you, the mandate on this life is not to die comfortable. I'm telling you. It's the idol it's the idol of a retirement on an island somewhere we do, and we just die very, very comfortable. But that's not what I see in the Bible. Have you read about the lives of the disciples? The early church? The call? It's going to have full of trials and full of tribulations. And I'm telling you, one of the ways that we fight and we deal with our apathy is we embrace discomfort. We embrace it. Paul did that. And as he navigates life, he says, he, he spoke and he, he embraced the pains, the challenge, the beatings, the, the loss of security, the loss of income, the, the loss of safety. He embraced it. And I know you're saying, yes, I feel like I'm signing up at a conscription meeting and the, the guy's telling me a hard war is going to be. That's what church is every Sunday. We just don't do you justice. I want to tell you, the gospel calls us to a battle zone. Have you ever watched, and maybe you're not a rugby player, but have you ever watched a guy apathetically run into someone tackling them? It's just, 
Yeah, flip, this is not a good, uh, dead, you like dead. There's like some big Afrikaans, man, because that is the, the world's best gene for Afrikaans, just uh, for rugby. It's just, it's like, uh, when I watched my little guys up there, that, uh, the line were there and they were down playing a big opposition and the, they kicked it off, boom, to the captain. Now my boy, he's pushing a solid 40 something kgs and the captain of the other team's pushing 110. And, and I'm, all I'm thinking in my heart is, no, Judah. He's sitting at the top. I'm watching. Then I just see this little f- character run. And I think, and all the others, all the big guys with a hundred, they're all like this. And he took that giant down. And I celebrate that. But I want to tell you, it's the call of the church. We love David and his story. But David took a giant down. David got to a battlefield where a whole army was apathetic. So God had to take a teenager kid from a field, send him in with cheese and biscuits, said, I'm going to slay a giant. Why? Because of what he's saying to the armies of God. And I want to fire that up in you. I wanted to realize we're in a battle zone. There is an enemy. He is, enemy. He is destroying families. He is destroying destinies. He is destroying lives. And we are the church. We're the church. We have the hope of glory inside of us. I can't be apathetic about that. And David is a prime example of the risk of apathy in our lives. It starts like this because he achieves so much. But if you've read anything about King David, he had a very low moment. In 2 Samuel 11, in the spring, at the time when kings went off to war, in the, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. Here's how the story plays out. She comes to him. They sleep together. She falls pregnant. She tells him. He calls Uriah, her husband, back and comes up with this plan to send Uriah. And the next day they go to battle, he says, actually place Uriah on the front lines because he knows he's going to die. And this is David. Man described as a king after God's own heart. A man described as a picture of worship, dedication, and fulfilled in the promises of God. This is David, the warrior king. But it says to us, and we see the problem right at the start, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. That's what they did. It wasn't a convenient time, but I don't feel like this spring. It was a time where battles, where armies prepared throughout the autumn into winter, and then spring came, they went to war to defend their territories, to take ground, and to keep extending the ground. This was the king under whom there was incredible growth within the kingdom of God. But at that moment, David succumbed to apathy. And you know what happened? They still had victory out there, but he lost the battle here. They still had victory. And you know what the result of that was? Sin and death. And I want to tell you, apathy always ends up where we never thought it could take us. And we can self-justify again. David could have just said, but I fought battle after battle. I'm a battle weary. I've raised, I'm, I'm delegating. I'm delegating. I mean, that's just the word of the century. I'm delegating this battle to my army. And the challenge is he sits at home and he sees something. You know what happens? You know when we fall and people are fighting all sorts of battles and we're fighting and I know I've been hammering Facebook fights and I've been seeing, but I'm telling you the church needs to be on mission together. When we're on mission, we stop seeing the distractions. Doesn't mean there aren't beautiful women around. Doesn't mean there aren't distractions around. It just means the mission's bigger. And we get pulled into that, and apathy starts to die in our hearts. So, one way we do this, and I just want to give it, is how do we fight and embrace discomfort? Well, this is what I suggest consistently exposing yourself to something that creates a righteous discomfort in your life. Here's what I'd suggest to you. You know that route you always take home, it's a little bit longer, but it avoids some of the tougher parts of our city where you are forced to be made uncomfortable by your house you call a garage, where other people in our city don't even have a house for their children. You know how you make yourself and embrace discomfort? Take the route that takes you in and through and then allow the things that break his heart to break yours. And the church would never have to motivate for alms giving or giving to the poor ever again. You know how you embrace discomfort? 
will allow people into your life and your story who have got broken stories and broken challenges, but we self-justify, well, we don't have time and we don't have this and we've done it before. No, allow them into your world. Take 20 minutes and hang around after church. Just be here. Meet someone and allow God to open up your heart. You know what? You become uncomfortable, but apathy will start to die. And, 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 and maybe just give. Give time, talents, treasures. Maybe give irrationally to your wife, your spouse, your children, your family. Just, just find yourself in a position of irrational, faithful giving. You know what? It'll become uncomfortable because the next month's coming and this is coming. Give of your time. Give of your talents, your treasure. But I'm tired. I work hard. No, give and trust God. You know what starts to die? Apathy. Secondly, I want to challenge us. Embrace discomfort. Embrace disruption. Who likes disruption? This is the world we live in. We're sitting on our couch, and you can't see me, so I'm going to sit like that. And, 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 and the world, everything is right in the world. Everything. You're watching your favorite series. And then the dreaded disruption. On my TV, it looks like this, a circle just going round and round in the middle. It's like, no, God! Just a circle. And the disruption leads to an eruption. Because your comfort has been disrupted. And now you're shouting at ESCOM and you're shouting at your service provider and you're shouting at the maker of the TV. And all of a sudden you realize, shucks, that's become my everything. And yet the Bible challenges us and calls us to follow God, His plans. And, and Paul, again, is this incredible challenge. He, he, he speaks about five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. A disruption. Some of us are like, I got stuck in the traffic this morning. He got lashed. Three times I was beaten with, lo- with rods. I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Anyone done that for the gospel recently? <laughs> Not me. I live in the suburbs. I'm trying to present to us that the challenge of the gospel is not one to a life of ease and comfort. That's the seduction. You're looking at a guy who spent a decade of his life marketing products. We, we would design the packaging in beautiful ways and shout about how fat-free the products were and how amazing they were for kids' development and sensory things, but no one spoke about how much sugar was in that thing. I know, I'm a marketing guy. The devil is an unbelievable marketer. He makes things look so good with so many promises, but we forget behind that is an agenda of death and dying. And we need to stand up and rise up against it, and the only way is by killing apathy. We remind us, and, 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 but one way I challenge, yes, embrace discomfort, which means put yourself in situations. If your life is not uncomfortable, position yourself in a way that it can be made uncomfortable. Secondly, position yourself in a way where the Spirit of God that we see all through the book of Acts that is full of this, world, this word, suddenly. Let me just give you a few examples. Who likes suddenlies? Like you're a planner, you organize your life, your diary, you don't like suddenlies. Don't spring that on me. Well, this is the Bible. Book of Acts, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Acts 2, that's when the Spirit of God was put out. You know what God didn't give them? A warning or a meeting agenda. As he, Paul, was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. Acts 9, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. I mean, could you imagine Peter? He's in jail going, why'd you wake me up? I've just got to sleep. No, suddenly God broke in. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken at once. All the doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Acts 16. I want to tell you, the book of Acts is full of suddenlies. And if I'm spending my life fighting any disruption in my life, I'm telling you, you're going to miss the God opportunities in life. And apathy will start to creep in. Why? Because I've got it under control. I've got it all under control. And corona comes and the whole world falls apart, but the churches stand because they, ah, another opportunity for the gospel. Yes, it's a disruption financially, sure. Yes, it's a disruption with our kids and their schooling, sure. But the king is still on his throne. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to embrace disruption in my life. And lastly, embrace disdain. Now, I realize when I said that this morning, now the masks are gone, I can actually see your faces. And I realize some people didn't know what disdain meant. So disdain essentially means this, it's a contempt of someone or something, or another word would be scorned. 
So meaning to embrace disdain is to embrace the idea or even the concept that you could be scorned, that you could be not liked. Now let me tell you one idol in our world, being liked. <laughs> we live in a world that operates on a currency of likes and dislikes. And life has been reduced down to likes on Instagram, follows on Facebooks, and hits on Twitch. I don't even know what Twitch is, but I thought I'd throw it in there. So I want to be contextually relevant to the Gen X, Z, Y, P. I'm not quite sure what they are. Um, but here's the honest truth from a pastor trying to be honest with you today. Christianity is not a popularity contest. It's not the church has got talent. Come and see. That's how the world operates now. That's not how this operates. The only identity and affirmation I need is the love of a living God who says I'll spend eternity with him. And in the mess of the middle that we live in, I need to find complete satisfaction, complete identity, and fulfillment in that promise. And so here's a scripture from Luke chapter 6. But I, I found it in the message version this morning. I wanted to read it to you because it challenges this very concept in our lives. This is Jesus. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others. Saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are, to you who are already for the truth, I say this. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff, live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you would want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run of the mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think it's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers do that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity for the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when you're at your worst. Our Father is kind. Embrace disdain. To be a disciple of Jesus is not to win a popularity contest. Standing next to a field watching rugby the, the other day and a father in the, who knows me, doesn't really know me, but knows that I'm a pastor, within one second it's the question, hey, what do you think about homosexuality? Because he already knows what he thinks he knows about what I think. Because I'm a Christian. What do you think about this and... and and you know that you're going into environments without saying a word, there's a prejudice. It was amazing. In my 10-year school reunion, I was a corporate marketing guy doing well. At my 20-year school reunion, I was a 20, I was a pastor. She so come back to the crowd. 10-year, high five, 20-year, oh, we saw on Facebook, you're right. You're okay, she's midlife crisis. So it's okay. Get okay with it. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, where apathy doesn't determine your steps, I want to tell you, get okay with embracing disdain. I'm not saying you have to like it. I'm not saying you have to go after it. I'm not propagating, standing on the corner going, turn or burn. No, I don't buy into that. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about be okay with people not getting you. And you know what? Apathy will start to die. It looks like this. Looks like young couples choosing not to live together before marriage. If you're in the room and that's your situation, come and talk. Let's navigate. Let's trust God together. It looks like people allowing the order of God to come in their finances. It looks like us submitting to leaders and authority, even when we think they're making the wrong decision and still choosing to honor. It looks like honoring your father and mother, not because they're good or left you a trust fund, just because the Bible said so. That's what it looks like. That's what defeating apathy feels like, sounds like. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Jesus challenges us 
and I would say even burdens us. There's a burden. I live with the burden of living in a world where there are challenges and pressures, but there's another burden, a burden that there's a world who don't know Jesus, who haven't received his grace, who haven't received the touch of his blood, who haven't received salvation and won't spend an eternity with the glorious Father. I live with that burden. Do you live with that burden? Because if you live with that burden, I'm telling you, you've signed up for an army and you're in a battle now. And if you're standing on the battlefield apathetic, you will get sorted. Because even though we can't see it, the Bible says there's weapons of this war, and it's blades and knives, and it's the spiritual fight that's going on. And if you're standing in neutral gear, you are going backwards. You're going backwards. I want to pray a Franciscan blessing over you because written by a guy much older than me. <laughs> Why don't you stand with me? I read this prayer, and it challenges me, and I trust it will challenge you. I preach this word today knowing that it is a challenging word. But when I come before this blood and this body that is broken, we're going to take communion together, so if you want to get your emblems. The gospel is not a response to the good life on this side of eternity. In eternity, I'm with the Father. In eternity, there'll be no pain. In eternity, there'll be no cancer. In eternity, there'll be no short or lack or economic ups and downs or rises and falls of markets and economies. But I'm on this side of eternity. I'm in the in the in-between where I have access to the more of heaven. I have access to the King of Kings. I have access to his presence. But I've got to trust him in this journey and navigating this journey. And I want to tell you how you're going to do that. You're going to fight, do that by attacking and defeating apathy, embracing discomfort, embracing disruption, embracing disdain. This was the prayer. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done doesn't sound like a blessing, does it? No, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. It's a blessing because there's the grace of God. Every time we respond, it's a blessing. Because on every time we come to this body that was broken, there's a power of heaven. There's a possibility of heaven breaking every time, every time, every time. Even as we gather now, I believe cancer can leave. As we gather now, I believe uh, oppression and cycles of addiction can be broken. As we gather now, I believe depression can leave because of the power of His blood that never fails. That was an amazing sermon. If you would like to find out what your next step is, why don't you go to our website, lifechanges.org.za or follow us on social media to find out about what is happening in the life of our church. Life Changes Church, we love you. Have an amazing, amazing week.